Roxana, thanks so much for uh, agreeing to come on to the Nature Watch Foundation conference uh, all to discuss everything related to Ukraine um, and the relationship between people and animals. So um, we're just going to have a chat today about your involvement in, in everything that's been going on. So just tell me about you and your involvement so far in animal welfare, what you've done previously. Mm -hmm. So since 2006, uh, we are running a charity in Poland, Sierocinec. Uh, we create a sanctuary for all dogs. So uh, people, they don't want to take care anymore of all dogs or um, the uh, public shelters. They cannot take proper care of all dogs because of the treatment, meds, uh, the environment they need. Uh, that, um, we, adopt, we are adopting them and they are staying with us to the end of their life. Okay, amazing. So these are generally older dogs and, and dogs that yes. have a, a lot more needs than you would for a dog that's really Yes. Cool. Yes. Okay. And, and what else do you do in terms of animal welfare? So what's your background? My background. Uh, so I'm a dog behaviorist and dog trainer. Uh, I'm working in Poland and in uh, UK now. Uh, I create a program, Sniff Your, How, uh, your Home, Your New Home. Uh, so we try, uh, we, we are still uh, training uh, volunteers at shelters in Poland. Uh, so they will be able to enrich the dog's life and shelter by some, doing some nose work. Mm -hmm. um, and people, that, when they see that the dog can find cinnamon uh, objects or other people, because we are also uh, teaching them how to do mantrailing with some uh, dogs. Um, they are like much more kind to adopt a dog mm -hmm. uh, with some skills. Um, so uh, the kids like it. So we are uh, training volunteers. Um, and of course, we are doing a lot of programs about animal welfare um, in small villages because we are, our charity is based in a small village. So we are trying to um, teach people that uh, taking care of animals, taking the animals to the vet, all kinds of animals. Uh, it's really important. Mm -hmm. So as uh, you saw, we uh, are now uh, building a small vet clinic that people from the village could use uh, for their pets so they don't need to travel to a different village for any Amazing. treatment or like vaccination and things like that. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. That's really good to hear. And I think, you know, we, we both agree that it's gonna be something that's really valuable uh, for animal welfare and, and obviously the communities. Um, so it, I guess let's let's go round on to uh, Ukraine um, and, and what's mm -hmm. going on there. So obviously we met in uh, in Medica in Poland uh, yes. back in March. So how did you end up in Medica? How did you get there? Uh, so I'm from Poland uh, and we are living close to the Ukrainian border. And as soon as the war starts, we knew we need to go there and uh, help. Uh, so my husband and my sister and me went there in the second weekend of the war uh, with whole car of supplies for dogs and uh, some medication. And we went to uh, support and organize a convoy from Medica. So on a Facebook uh, group, a lot of people say that they're coming to Medica on the weekend. Uh, so we organized a convoy. Everyone brought whatever they were possible to arrange in such a short time. And in Lviv, uh, Olya, our friend that is having their a charity, um, was responsible for giving the supplies and everything to people they are in need to give it to the shelters they need food. Uh, because at the beginning of the war, uh, there was no point to send money to Ukraine because they couldn't, they were not able to buy anything. Mm -hmm. So it was really important to create a change of food from Poland to Ukraine. Yeah, so aid deliveries and things, because yes. there's no, no produce in Ukraine to physically buy. Uh, yes, the, the biggest uh, food company in Ukraine, the warehouse, like Purina warehouse, were closed the second day after the war started. Yeah. So people couldn't just buy and get any money. Uh, any food for dogs, food. even if yeah. they had money, yeah. So before you arrived in Medica, what did you expect to, to see and, and, and things like that? What, what were you expecting? Did you have any preconceived idea as to what you would find? So I thought everything will be organised. I thought the big charities are already there with 
tents um, and like possibilities to hit the water for people, uh, have mats for dogs, food for dogs, food for people, kids and everything. What we saw was completely different and unexpected, unexpected for us. So um, we saw a queue of people that are hungry, that are tired with dogs and cats in buckets, plastic bags, on the hands. Um, there was a, one of the dog was already so cold that it needs a electric blanket to heat, uh, like to raise the body temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't expect at all what we saw, uh, but uh, it was good because the next time we came, uh, one week later, we were much better prepared. Yeah, because you, you you knew what to expect because obviously you'd have yes. the the, uh, the the former visit. So, um, I mean, obviously we have to remember that you know the time this all started. Um, I remember first getting there and it was so cold. So you know, yes. at night when when people were coming over and then queuing up, it, it got to something like minus six one night, didn't it? Yes. Um, which you know kind of changed the dynamics a little bit as to what was vital at the time. Yes, but uh, because we were there uh, uh, before, uh, I could already tell you that people need gloves. So mm -hmm. when it starts to be cold, we were able to take the big uh, boxes with gloves uh, and give, uh, deliver that in the queue to people. So at least they are like uh, don't have like frozen hands. Mm -hmm. So I think all what the small charities did, and it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what, you know, the, the time that we were in Medica, we uh, initially had a few days there. So um, just just explain a little bit about uh, what you did, what, you know, uh, how mm -hmm. long we were there for and that sort of thing in Medica. So one of the big chari uh, dog charity in Poland created their, rented their a field. Uh, a, a charity from Denmark brought uh, some kind of mobile houses mm -hmm. uh, that we could put dogs there. And that was the point where all the help uh, started from the beginning. So it was a point where we all met uh, and I met some vets, some other people, and I also were able to tell people just go there and um, we will organize something together. So it was amazing how many people from different countries uh, were able to help. Uh, my husband is um, not a dog person. He's not uh, like, he's a chemist but uh, he was the, uh, one of the uh, person who was able to speak uh, English because he's Scottish and Polish at the same time. So he got involved in organizing all the help from people that are coming there from abroad. Mm -hmm. So he was responsible for people from uh, Denmark, England, uh, Germany, to tell them what to do, where to go, how to organize things like that. So like everyone were involved and that was amazing. Um, so in the beginning, we need really a lot of suppliers there. There was like a lot of need of uh, transporters for dog, uh, crates for dogs, a uh, small amount of food, and thanks the help from Nature Watch, for example, we were able to prepare a uh, supplies bag. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we came there first time, we noticed that there is a lot of dog food, but in really big bags, and people are not able to take it with them. Yeah. To carry it because the people are exhausted. They have no uh, suitcase or anything where they can put it. So we create um, a supplies bag. Our uh, friend from Poland uh, translates it uh, that it's like for free. Uh, so it means Beskoshtova in Ukraine. Uh, so people, we were just walking and even if we couldn't communicate with people, we were just showing them the bag. And they could read that it's for free supplies back for cats, dogs, or uh, children, or moms with small children. Mm. Uh, and we could deliver that. So it was like really well organized uh, later. Because people, people actually expected to have to pay for things, didn't they? So aid bags, yes. there was this um, assumption that, you know, we would be charging for things like that. Yes, because uh, like no one is prepared for a situation like this. Uh, and the people didn't knew that the help is for free uh, because of the language barrier. We couldn't tell them it's for free. So they were afraid that they need to pay us for something. Uh, and on the beginning, on the border in Medica, there was only one girl who was speaking fluent uh, Ukrainian and Polish. Mm -hmm. 
And there was so many people from so many countries, they tried to help, but they didn't know how to communicate uh, with each other. I, I remember a few times trying to um, explain cat and dog just by, you know, meowing or woofing at somebody, which yes. worked to a certain extent. Um, you could establish what animal they were talking about, because obviously some of these people had uh, had arrived, say, a few hours before and gone to the nearest refugee camp uh, and then come back to sort of pick up supplies that they obviously couldn't get or, or whatever. So, yeah, there's quite a few occasions where I remember sort of trying to explain that fleas and, and ticks and things like that without actually yes. being able to speak. Because the first wave of people that arrived in Medica, that were people, they just ran away. Mm -hmm without anything, without suitcase, without food for the dogs, cats, children, yeah. uh, without nappies, without leads often, uh, anything. Uh, and they had no idea where they where to go. Uh, they didn't have like a safe place in Poland, like friends or someone else. Uh, and in the refugees camp also, no one knew how to organize it in the beginning. Uh, so yes. That was like a huge misunderstanding between everyone, but everyone were amazing and trying to help. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that uh, initially in the first sort of three, four weeks after, it was people genuinely fleeing for their lives, wasn't it? From, from the yes. war zone that they were, they were terrified in. Um, so um, yeah, it, 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 you know, there, there were people that I remember that turned up with a little carry bag full of something that they'd, they'd managed to collect or some people with nothing at all. Um, yes, mm. but I think everyone was speaking with the heart, so that's why everyone were able to understand each other. Yeah, definitely. And is, is there anything that you remember as like a standout story or, or uh, like people individually that you remember that came through with their animals? Animals. Um, so uh, I went there to help people with animals, but as you know, you ended like helping everyone mm -hmm. because you just couldn't leave uh, someone without uh, help. But yes, with animals, I really remember the uh, small uh, Frenchie that was freezing. Uh, the girl was traveling already three days with a dog under her jacket because they just escaped uh, as they stand. And it was uh, winter and she was wearing trainers. And my husband brought her, I took the dog and my husband brought her a cup of uh, hot tea. And I was trying to tell her that it's really hot and she should be careful, but her hands were so frozen that she just grabbed it and hold it. Um, yeah, and I think like two, three days longer, or maybe like even one or two, and the dog wouldn't make it because yeah. the girl was frozen. She couldn't warm it up, him up with her body temperature because she was also frozen. Mm -hmm. And when we took them to the car, because they had no place to go, and I told them that there is a refugee center. So it was her, her brother and her mom, and we took them to the car. Uh, they fell asleep before we left the car park. Yeah. They were just sleeping, like they were so tired. And then they, we were sitting like on the refugee center with them in the car because we didn't know if we should wake them up or not. Yeah. So we were just waiting with them okay. in the car. First time they probably felt, you know, safe for, for many days, I imagine. Yes, because they traveled with the dog. With um, So on the beginning, uh, you couldn't take any suitcase to the train because uh, there was just no place. Mm. They tried to put as many people as possible uh, to one train. Um, so they didn't have like nothing, nothing. She didn't even have like a handy bag, nothing. She just had the dog. Yeah. And... I think it's amazing, uh, and she was very brave. Um, she was responsible for her brother and her mom. And you need to be very brave to go with your dog on holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, so imagine going with your dog to a different country where you don't know anyone and you don't know where to stay, but still you are taking your dog with you. I think they're heroes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think from the amount of people that we saw with their animals, like, you know, different types of animals, not just dogs, so cats, um, you know, rodents, and, and even somebody with a with a 50p pence terrapin that they decided yes. to put in a jar and and thought um, that their life is is worth as much as theirs in terms of they, their life. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. Yes, and it was amazing that people uh, on train station decide not to put the suitcase to the train, but make a space for a dog. Yeah, yeah. Or someone with a cat or any animals. I think it's amazing that people yeah. in situations like this think about their animals. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And that's why they need people as us there on the border. They will be able to provide small amount of food, help them with having a bowl, water, lead, collar, mats, and things like, like that. Mm -hmm. Because it's obvious that the big charities are helping like children, people, yeah. uh, humans. So there needs to be always someone who is helping the animals there. Because yeah, it's amazing. And I think um, are one, taking them. one thing that I think was um, really obvious from, from when we were there is that by helping animals, you are helping these people anyway, because there's a lot yes. of people I imagine that haven't left Ukraine and have left themselves in, in quite scary and dangerous situations because they would not leave their animals behind. Um, yes. So, you know, by providing the animals with something, you're actually helping the, the people to to feel more confident in, in leaving, um, you know, their country anyway. Yes, mm, definitely. definitely uh, yes. And also um, all the refugee center, uh, they create like some kind of room for animals or like a place where you could stay. Or we met a lady with two dogs. They didn't like other dogs. And uh, the Italian people in the refugee center create for her a kind of cage or something like this in a really big room with 1,000 other people and dogs. Mm -hmm. and so she can feel safe there and her dog so she can rest. Uh, there were people, they were just like offering to walk the dog or like carrying the dog or animal in the queue. You, like you were one of these mm -hmm. uh, people. Um, so the help was amazing on the border. For people and for animals. her, that must have been just so important to be able to, to manage that situation rather than the additional stress of having a, a dog reactive dog uh, in, in such sort of organized chaos that was the, uh, the refugee center where you've just got so many people. Yes, it, definitely. And it gives her time to rest, think what she can do later, mm -hmm. how to deal with the situation, where to go. Uh, go to, for a shower. The, the people didn't have shower for a few days. Yeah. Uh, so it was amazing that someone thought about this, how to help the people with animals there so they can go uh, and take care of themselves to be strong and, uh, because they need to be strong in that situation. Yeah, definitely. So just moving on from uh, sort of the time mm -hmm. at, at Medica then, what has been happening in Poland um, with these people who have brought the pets over, but also the, the thousands and thousands of, um, sort of street animals and shelter animals that have also been brought over from Ukraine? So what, what's been happening there? Uh, so our charity, uh, we're, we tried to help in three different ways. First, it was the suppliers back on the border. Uh, and that was... Uh, just like a bowl, small amount of food, chewies, uh, mats and things like that. And that was like on the border to just help them. But then uh, the people were staying in Poland, most of them. So uh, they needed food and things like that. So we create an email where they could write uh, to us a message uh, that they need food for cats, dogs, uh, or anything else. And we were delivering that. As a small charity, we thought that maybe like 10 people will get in contact uh, with us. We didn't expect the amount of people they were in need. Uh, they didn't know where to go, uh, what to do with the dogs, how to get the um, passports and things like that, because a lot of the people were, uh, Poland was just like a place for a few days a week, uh, and then they were going forward. Um, so that was a way we helped. And then the third, uh, thing what we try to do is organize as big huge amount of money as possible and deliver that to ukraine and it was amazing that um in Przemysl, the warehouse uh, someone create a warehouse just the site one day they will create a warehouse and the deliver to ukraine was complete for free so all we need to do from our side is organize the food and make sure it will be in Przemysl. 
And then uh, it was going to different places in Ukraine. And our Ukrainian friends were responsible for uh, distributing it to them people they were in need because of the language barrier. They knew better who needs the help, who stayed there with dogs, who collect the dogs from the village, because there was a lot of people and they decide to stay because of different reasons. Uh, and like people from the village just gave all the dogs and cats to these people, to this house. So we, there were ladies, they ended with like 12 dogs and 16 cats in the house. And um, so the, our Ukrainian friends knew about these people and were able to deliver them food. What was really important. So why do you think it's important for us to help the animals of Ukraine? So you've obviously got the owners coming over and I you know, understand why we'd help them. But why would we need to help the, the other animals that are still in Ukraine and those that are brought over? Uh, because they're in the war zone and I can feel they have emotion mm -hmm. and they are also scared. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we know that and we know about animal welfare, animal well-being, we need to help them. We need to help people there. They were able to help the animals there. We cannot leave animals because it's a war. It's not an excuse. Uh, so, uh, so what we did, like I was calling Olya, asking them what they need. So the help is like really well organized mm -hmm. because uh, we thought maybe they need that or maybe they need that. And then I called Olya and she said, like, no, actually, we need a lot of pasta. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean with pasta? Like pasta, pasta. And she said, like, yes, because most of our dogs are on home diet. They are not used to cables, to dry food, cans. Uh, and people are scared to change it now. Uh, it's not the best time to change your dog diet when there is a war. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we said we bought a lot of pasta and we sent pasta. <laughs> we never thought they will need pasta, so it was really important that we were in contact with someone from there who exactly knows what people need there. And I think it was amazing that uh, there were places that people just cook big pots of uh, meat with pasta and uh, collect as much balls as possible. So we were sending like metal uh, balls to Ukraine and just put it on the street. It's something that I um, I didn't know before, obviously working with um, with the animals in Ukraine. So, you know, in, in the UK and, and, you know, across across other places in Europe, then we've got dried food and you have wet food and even raw food. Um, but I've never heard of these sort of mass um, sort of produced homemade meals for dogs. So, um, yes. yeah, it was certainly a learning curve for me. Yes. Uh, it's still in, in some places in Poland, it's still popular but not so much anymore and i had no idea it's so popular in ukraine mm -hmm. uh, i don't know if you remember the lady in the refugee center that we tried to give like really good quality dog food mm -hmm. and she said like no no maybe you have like any kind of can with meat or for humans like can um uh, like a ham mm -hmm. or maybe you have some pasta mm -hmm. <laughs> that she can do yeah absolutely and uh, you know i remember there was a lady that had um some dogs and you know again really high quality dry food that we've, we've managed to get over there in, in really good bags um that um you know she she just sort of looked at like it was alien and I, I initially didn't understand why she wasn't almost like you know snatching it from me to be able to use for her dogs but actually it's because she'd been used to boiling up you know bones and making a broth and, and all sorts yes. so um yeah it was yes. certainly a, a learning curve for me and I was amazed that in a situation like this, people still think um, that the dog needs the food they are used to, because it is really important. There, were, there would be nothing worse than having a sick dog now or a dog with diarrhea in a situation like, like this. So I was amazed that people are still like thinking clear the dog needs to get what they are used to eat. So there was a lady that we went to a butcher buy her dog raw food because she was like my dogs are on raw diet i cannot yeah. them like now something yeah. else and we were like yeah okay we will just go to the butcher and sort it yeah definitely yeah mm. okay um what we'll do we'll just stop the recording because we're running out of mm -hmm. time that they give and then we'll come back on to the other one so let me um sort that okay 
uh, but it's good because it didn't like maybe it would stop some people from helping, but it didn't. So like it's a good thing. Uh, so now we are struggle with like a lot of animals um, that are still with us, um, and like uh, uh, you know probably they will stay in Poland for a really long time, especially that the adoption abroad are blocked. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we need to organize food and money for like uh, vet treatment and things like that for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so no one expect we will have them for so long in Poland. Everyone thought it will be like two, three months um, and they will be adopted by, like with different countries. They will go somewhere else. Uh, someone will take of them, but it didn't happen with all of the animals so we we have them and it's our now responsibility to take care of them like proper take care of them and make sure we will do everything to find them a house mm -hmm. a home. and um your charity took in some dogs from ukraine yes um, we are having four dogs from ukraine now okay uh, so we took uh on the beginning of the war we decide not to take any dogs uh because we were curious what will happen and um how we can help in like a month for how it will be uh, so we because we are a small charity we needed like to leave some place uh for the dogs they will come uh, and it was good because um after like few months of the war maybe it was like after six or seven weeks um there was a shelter that was um that dogs caused neurological problems because uh, of an explosion that happened uh, very close to them. Mm -hmm. And we knew that's the dogs that we need to take. So we have DJ, mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, very long now with us, like four months mm -hmm. or five. Uh, his name is DJ because of the explosions. Uh, his ear got here, uh, hurt, and now he's like, um, all the time making like bobbing, bobbing his head so he's uh, yes yeah. yes okay. uh, so now we are having four dogs from ukraine uh, all with neurological problems caused by uh, explosion or mm. maybe like crazy amount of fear yeah uh, we don't know uh, but they are good uh, we are not looking for a new home for them because the treatment is uh, costing really a lot of money uh, and also they are still having like x-rays and MRIs and they need like a lot of visit with eye doctors, ear doctors, mm -hmm. uh, specialists. Uh, and we want to make sure that um, it will happen, that we will do everything uh, to help them. Uh, and also um, we are trying uh, to organize some help uh, by some vets. They can learn on our dogs, they are in Poland, but they are from Ukraine and go when it will be safe, of course, to Ukraine. Uh, and then they will know better like how to help uh, because there is a lot of dogs. They mm -hmm. have like uh, here problems now because of the explosions. Yeah. Uh, so they can go there for one, two days and help uh, in the shelters there. Amazing. So I, I guess it's something that um, some people don't even think of is that these animals that have been removed or even the ones that still remain in Ukraine are also massively affected by um, things that go on in a, in a war zone, whether it be sight, sound, smells, you know, things like that. Um, and actually, these animals have no idea what's going on. So it, no. it, it sounds like really valuable work for vets to go from Poland that have sort of looked into these dogs outside yes. of Ukraine to go over there. Um, um, I'm a beh behaviorist, so it's also interesting for me because before no one talked about PSD syndrome at dogs. PTSD, PTSD yeah. Syndrome at dogs. And uh, with Nella, one of the dog uh, from Ukraine that is with one and Shirochinets, she needs a lot of behavioral work. Okay. She's very scared now of tiny, tiny noises, uh, quick movements. Um, and we know from the volunteers from the shelter that she was not like this before. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think like it's uh, also a huge opportunity for us to learn how to help animals from war zone like be with behavioral problems because um, they can feel they were also scared they were also mm -hmm. they, they had no idea what's going on 
So now it's, it's, it's probably a um a problem that actually is not thought of as a priority, but perhaps it needs to be it's sort of um thought of quite um crucially for these animals and the potential for them to be rehomed because we can all think of you know uh, fixing injuries and broken legs that's that's not a problem we can fix that yes um but what can we do to fix what's going on in here for some of these yeah. animals that have been through yes. so much yes so uh, brian one of the other dog from ukraine um probably he tried to go out of a fence or something like this so he learned how to jump very, very high. Right. So we actually built like a kind of roof mm -hmm. uh, because he's uh, able to escape from everything, probably because he was in such a big panic. So now when he's feeling a little bit of fear mm. uh, or he don't know what is happening, he's just trying to escape, mm -hmm. but he can really hurt himself with yeah. that. So, yeah, he's like... Uh, you need to fix, you need to make them feel safe again. Mm -hmm. And what um, what advice, you know, if there was one piece of advice that you would give to somebody that has rehomed a dog from a war zone and, you know, the, the, the temperament is one that's nervy and that sort of thing, what one bit of key advice would you give to that person? Nose work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nose work. Uh, depending of the dog, what kind of nose work it would be. Mm -hmm. Um, but definitely no sport because the dogs uh, were born with the ability to find food. It's what they did the whole life, thousands mm -hmm. of years. And we are uh, somehow taking a little bit this uh, away from the dogs by giving them food in the bowl. Uh, and also with walks, with everything, it's not like so interesting anymore for uh, the dogs because we are having a ball or we are having like thousands of uh, tricks we are trying to teach them so they don't have the possibility to sniff long enough as they need mm -hmm. and we know that sniffing uh, release endorphins and we know that sniffing helps the dog to calm down so any kind of nose work yeah i would advise any kind of nose work treat searching and, and, and people can do that at home can't they really easily yes. they don't need yes. any, any special equipment or to go anywhere specifically it can be done in a garden or you know wherever they are Yes, we are trying now to create a online, uh, so an ebook that will be for, delivered for free, how to help the dog uh, to calm down after adoption. So it will be for everyone. Uh, they need uh, something like um, any ideas how to help the dog in the house so they don't need to, uh, to worry. Because I don't think taking the dog for classes would be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, because the dogs need, so dogs need about three weeks uh, for cortisol to go down. Uh, after a stressful situation. So I don't think that after uh, the war, the transport, that was not... Uh, so my dog, um, my private dog, when I took her first time to UK, she didn't pee for 26 hours. She was used to the crate, she was used to the car, but we were stressed uh, and she could feel our fear. So she was afraid what's going on, why we are stressed, why we are in the car so long. Um, and that, like, she was really stressed uh, for the first uh, few weeks we were here. So you can imagine now a dog that was mm -hmm. never travel or travel only in like a car with owner or a small car. And now like the dogs were transported with like stranger people, stranger cars, sometimes without the crate, sometimes in the crate that they don't know. Uh, so it was must be very stressful for the dogs and then they're spending time in shelter they don't know the people who are working there they don't know the routine and everything and then they are going to a new how, uh, home uh, they don't know the people they don't know the area you don't know if the dog was living before in a village or in a city center with one person with kids older people uh, what was the routine of the dog so it's so many uh, triggers so many things that are changing in the dog life that it would be good if people will just give the dog time at home and try to do some nose work exercise, but at home. It's what so we would call like a bond. Yeah, it's like what we would call a period of decompression. So where you, yes. you literally just leave them to you know safety to their own devices to to bring that level yes. down a little bit. Yeah. Yes, and it would be like a good idea instead of giving the dog uh, the breakfast in the bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, just like let them search for uh, a breakfast, like creating a snuffle mat is really easy. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you need only like one hour and some piece of your old clothes and you can do something really uh, nice for the dog. Uh, so yeah, I think sniffing, sniffing, definitely sniffing and nose work. One thing that we do here in the summer, if it's too hot to take the dogs out for a walk, is that we'll uh, get a load of frozen peas uh, and throw them over our sort of quite large gravel driveway so the dogs have to, you know, sniff between the stones to try and find these peas. Yes. Uh, it keeps them busy. And actually the the um, uh, sort of energy that they release doing that sniffing is probably more than what they would, they would do having a walk where they're not allowed yes. to do that as much. Yes, because during sniffing, they're also using the brain. Mm -hmm. So a uh, dog um, is getting the scent, recognizing them is going to the brain. The dog is thinking of it's, uh, is the scent pleasant, unpleasant, safe, unsafe. Uh, is it a human uh, scent, dog, uh, food, uh, what I can do with this scent? So all the time they're processing the scent and all mm -hmm. the time they're using the brain. That's why nose work makes them feel calm because it's a nice way to use your brain because mm -hmm. you don't get the exciting uh, level of hormones in the brain. Mm -hmm. So the adrenaline level or in cortisol level is not going up. Uh, so that is helping to uh, keep them calm and like in a good mood. And first, what we need to change uh, with dogs that we are adopting or that are in the shelter or with the dogs that we took from Ukraine is make sure they are in a good mood then mm -hmm. everything will go easier. It's the same with us. Mm -hmm. When you are in a good mood, it's much easier to cope with new things mm. and they, like life challenges and everything. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's amazing advice. And I think people uh, probably undervalue the importance of, of getting the dog to start thinking and using the brain more and, and tiring them out that way rather than you know, throwing yes. falling apart. Um, so yeah, re really bad. Yeah, but Michele Muno, uh, he's a scientist from Italy, mm -hmm. uh, and he's observing uh, street dogs. Mm -hmm. So street dogs are sniffing about six hours a day. Wow. Okay. That that certainly you know explains a lot, doesn't it? And and if you were to compare yes. a, a dog um, that you know sleeps on the bed, has been bred in a house, they're, they're very different. So. Um, I, th I think, it, you know, personally, it's something that is, is, is vital for these animals, because I remember a lot of these animals that have been brought over from Ukraine were originally street dogs. They, they, they aren't used to uh, the washing machine. They, they don't necessarily want to sleep on the bed with, with somebody when somebody wants yes. them to. So, um, you know, having something uh, that you can think about their, their behaviour and their welfare mentally is, is quite clearly the key for these dogs that have come from a yeah. war zone. Also, um, the pipe that you create with food mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Yeah. This is uh, for nose work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the dog needs to sniff, 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 and then they will find the food. Mm, definitely. I'm doing a, a presentation at the conference on, on our drain pipe feeding stations. But uh, yeah, it, uh, to be fair, when we created them, I didn't even think that they'd be a um, kind of a, a scent work aspect to it. So that, that's good. Yes, well. because they're able to find the because the dog don't know that a pipe Mm. is giving you food mm. they need to sniff it mm -hmm. so he can sniff the food and then he will get it and then he will try to be closer and closer to place with the pipes yeah definitely that, that was part of our plan is to keep like a, a, a concentrated area for these dogs to be able to recognize and dogs. definitely it will work definitely it will work because uh, street dogs are also staying in a place where they can get easy food uh, without, uh, like, sniff food, but without having other predators next to them. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think the, the idea, um, you know, f feeding the street animals however way you can is, is obviously brilliant, but uh, dumping a bag of 10 kilos of, of dry dog food on the floor and it's a bit of a free-for-all is probably never going to be great for, for welfare apart from the food, is it? So. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to hear that you think that it would uh, it will benefit them in, in more ways than just feed. So that's great. Yes, so also it will help if uh, a dog will starve or something. Mm -hmm. They will be not able to eat very quick. Yeah. So it's also like a, a good Prevent reason. Prevent things like bloat um, and, and yes. other health. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, my, my dogs aren't starved and I can guarantee have never been starved, but they would gobble everything if there was a, yeah. if there was a 10 kilo bag of dog food on the floor. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess coming back to the work in Ukraine then with the animals. So 
knowing what you know now about you know you know we're now months and months into this war which I never thought we'd be at to, to be honest I think we probably underestimated yes. time scales for this so knowing what you know now and having seen and worked with the dogs that have come out of Ukraine and also the people is there anything that you would change about what we've done or, or what we could do for Ukraine and the animals yes actually a lot of things okay uh so now uh after the first weekend we were there the next weekend we came we were already better prepared like with the mm -hmm. suppliers back yeah the first weekend we were like everyone we brought uh, food in crazy amount of like bags and yeah. like they were big and i never thought that people will be not able to carry it mm -hmm. uh also the food that we bought in the can it was like the huge can because i thought like yeah they need to have as much as possible yeah. And I didn't thought that someone is already walking three days with a suitcase and a dog. And then you will give them like 10 extra kilo of dog food and they will need to carry that for the next three days. And also, so, I didn't realize or even think that how are these people going to spoon out dog food from a tin can? Oh, yeah, <laughs> like bowl. And the first time I went there, I didn't took any single bowl. Mm hmm. No, I, I didn't thought like about things like that. So yes, because of all the experience, I would change actually a lot of things. And I will go to my notes because mm -hmm. I wrote it down. So uh, I will create much more leaflets than we did. Uh, because we thought internet is the best solution. Mm -hmm. And it was not. Not everyone is using internet. Not everyone knew that they can get free internet in Poland. Mm -hmm. On the beginning, there was no free internet. And also the companies, they can deliver the internet. Takes them also a while uh, to provide such help. So as much as much leaflets as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, leaflets that are translated into Ukraine. Uh, because there was like some leaflets in other languages. Like, and we thought, yeah, definitely they know English or like they know Polish. Yeah. We are so close to each other. But no. Yeah. No, because you are thinking that uh, only young people are escaping and it's not the truth. So uh, one couple uh, that we met uh, on the border in Medica, it was a couple of uh, older couple and the children were in Denmark. And they were traveling from Denmark to uh, Medica to pick them up. But the people at the same time were traveling from Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. to meet them like in halfway. Uh, and because no one from us is speaking Ukraine, mm -hmm. there was like such a huge misunderstanding that almost the people were in the bus, uh, almost we sent the people in the bus to Warsaw. Oh, wow. Okay. Because they knew only three big cities in Poland. So they were saying all the time, like Warsaw, Krakow, Wrocław. And there was just a bus coming to Warsaw. So we were like, yeah, they can go to Warsaw. But no, that was the three cities that the sun also knew. Mm. And he was like trying to reach any of the city, but he was on the way. Mm -hmm. So like, thanks. Uh, there was someone who can speak Ukrainian. We were managed to fix it. Um, mm. And like, make sure the people are going to Wrocław and will meet the sun as soon as possible. Uh, and then we wrote a message to the sun on like Facebook on Messenger and they were safety there. So, no, you don't expect that not everyone has a cell phone, not everyone mm -hmm. knows internet, no everyone know how Google Maps work and things like that. You don't think that in other countries, things like that are not working or not, uh, are not and available. Also, uh, one thing I learned is that um, Google Translate has massive limitations. Limitation, what massive. It, like. it was awful. I remember um, we, we did one translation and we were looking bizarrely at uh, like cream for a cow's udders you know to uh, a soothing lotion and this translation came back which we, we were just absolutely like laughing uh, laughing at because it came back as udder mascara so actual mascara that you'd put on your eyelashes yeah like that. so it was just incredible to see how false it could be so let alone trying to translate with ukrainians when google translate comes up with udder mascara so yes, yeah <laughs> So definitely leaflets and information uh, as much as possible, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so it will be good to create like uh, a work for someone that mm -hmm. will just look for information and be able to provide all this information, like information center or something like, like this. But not uh, again, 
someone who is speaking Ukrainian. Uh, so that would be very important. I would create as much forms as possible for people they traveling with dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, they know what they can expect, uh, how to organize the food, vet help and everything uh, like this. So any kind of forms that you can contact back these people because that was like a huge problem for us that we we were able to tell them like go to Wrocław because on the train station in Wrocław our friends were given like also food and were also yeah. able to help but what if the person was going to like a small city or a small village mm -hmm. yeah. we were losing like the contact uh, with this person mm -hmm. so that was difficult uh, definitely I would contact immediately big charities uh, and try to organize um, as much supplies as possible mm -hmm. because the people that are there, the small charities, uh, I have the feeling that they knew what the people need, where people need crates, where people need uh, dog food, uh, dog supplies back, what kind of help, transport, like everything, but they just didn't have the source. Mm -hmm. to do it uh, so our charity without the help of your charity without the help of other charities we met there and then you knew different charities and you were able to ask it wouldn't be impossible to help this amount of people uh, if you will, are not open to work with other charities so, so definitely like, so I, I, would... I guess the, the key message on that is partnership working isn't it so we almost need the yes. funding yes. from big charities which I know we at one point yes. we got from I4, didn't we, when we when yes. purchased the, the 100 cat carriers or all of the... You know, the yes. Yeah. Today I would wrote definitely an email to charities in different countries just to organize, I don't know, a Zoom meeting or something like this and say, like, look, we know what they need. Yeah. Uh, we can tell you uh, we were there. Uh, let's look what we can do all uh, together. Who can organize what? Because you don't need to be there to yeah. help. Mm -hmm. This is something what I also learned. You really don't need to be there to help. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's important to like work together. Uh, definitely, I would also uh, organize place where dogs could stay after they cross the border and mm -hmm. a place where people can stay with dogs after they cross the border. Because uh, there was refugee center, but it was difficult for a lot of dogs. To stay there so uh like i'm a dog owner so when it's difficult for my dog it's making me my stress level high mm -hmm. uh, so definitely i would uh, help with something like this and organize like pet sitters pet workers they can take care for one two days of the dog so the people can just sleep and get a mm -hmm. uh, uh, rest um, and this is something what we try to organize uh, so the girls they were on leave train station they knew that to tell everyone who is traveling with a dog, go to Medica, because in Medica, there is a big blue tent with a lot of help. Mm -hmm. And there are people, they will definitely help you, whatever you need. But what was uh, very painful even to watch was people with dogs or like five dogs, four dogs, cats uh, with buckets standing and they had no idea what to do. Yeah. And uh, now where to get... Um, uh, a bag where, uh, for the dog where to get a crate. That was the worst. With, like, I never thought they will be needed so much crates. So definitely now, I if there will be a war in a different country, what we hope it will never happen, I will organize as much crates as possible. That would be the first thing what I would organize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crates, yeah. bowls, and food in small amount mm -hmm. of packet. Yeah. I think it's, but again, it's probably safe to say that for, for everybody, this has been a, a massive learning curve, hasn't it, in respect of what yes. you need, who needs it, and also the the effects mentally on the animals that are in Ukraine and, and are leaving as well as the people. Um, so, you know, w without the small charities like, like us and, you know, the, the, the ones um, on the conference later on as well, it's, it's so vital that we keep the support up because ultimately... The, the war in Ukraine gets gets lower and lower in terms of news outlets and what's in the press. And, you know, you don't necessarily hear about it every hour of every day now, but it's still going on. Um, yes, it's still going on. And a lot of uh, because I'm still having contact with people that we brought from Medica or we helped them somehow or organize a place to stay. 
in Poland uh, because of course it's easier for me because my parents live in Poland and I have a lot of friends there. Uh, we are still in contact with the people. Some people gave up and came, uh, went back to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are really running out of money in Poland and they really need a lot uh, of support now, different way of support for the dogs or cats. Um, they struggled with problems that we are struggling every day as pets owners, where to walk the dog, where to go to the vet, mm -hmm. uh, meds problems, um, vaccination, like everything what everyone from us knows from daily life with a dog. Mm -hmm. But we have the benefit of generally speaking the language of the country that we're in, I guess. And it must be twice as hard when you're in a country that you don't speak the language of. Yes, and I don't think a lot of the refugees know that in Wrocław, for example, because it's my city, so it's like easy. There are uh, a Ukrainian vet that is trying to help a lot of people. Okay. Uh, because of course of the language barrier, it's very difficult. I know like I'm in UK and my first visit of my dog in UK at the vet, where the rules are completely different. Yeah. We don't have insurance in Poland. We don't have, like we are going to any vet. You don't need to have an appointment. Like it's completely okay. different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was very stressful. So I'm guessing for those people, it's much, much more stressful. And I also think we need to think about a long-term uh, help for dogs. They are still in Ukraine and they need any kind of medical help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, from, you know, from me and I guess from, from everybody that has anything to do with the animals of Ukraine, thank you so much for the work that you've done, you know, since February and, and you're still doing today because as you've said, without the partnership working, without the smaller charities coming together, I don't think we could have achieved so far what we have achieved for these animals and animal welfare. Definitely. And so many private people helped as well mm -hmm. uh, with delivering things, with helping, with letting us know that someone mm -hmm. needs dog food. Yeah. Uh, some of the people were like, uh, there's a family in a village next to Wrocław. They have four dogs, four German shepherds. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course they cannot afford the food for mm -hmm. them um, because they need to rent a flat because they need to find a job uh, like buy new stuff because they are coming often with one suitcase uh, so it's important that our charity is, uh, that someone will let us know that there is a family like this and we are able to give them the food every month mm -hmm. Yeah. so it's really important like to inform people that there is someone in need what they need because definitely there is someone who can help definitely and and to keep talking you know we we talk often but you know there's, there's other charities that have obviously got other work that they do as well so I think it's really important that we all keep talking uh, we all keep telling uh, each other what the need is and where that need is, is required and things like that because you know for, for yes. as long as there is a need it's, it's vital isn't it Yes, even if all you can do is stay for two hours with someone dog, when they will try to find a job, it's a huge help. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, is there anything else that you um, think we haven't discussed or that you'd like to say about your work and, and uh, the animals of Ukraine, Oksana? No, I think it's everything. I really would like to thank everyone who helped us to be able to help because mm -hmm. we are a very small uh, charity. Um, and I think all the people we met on the border, they came with dogs that are very, very brave mm -hmm. or with cats, with other pets um, because they were fighting for their life, escaping with in stress and they were still thinking about their animals. And it's for me, it's heartbreaking because it's really lovely. And I think the people are heroes and they deserve our help when they are here. And the people who stayed there with animals Mm -hmm. uh, running shelters and other places they also deserve our help absolutely brilliant thanks so much Roxana I really appreciate you joining us today thank you very much